Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. Tonight we're going to focus on the deteriorating situation at the southern border. A few months ago we were having a debate over whether to use the term crisis when describing what's happening along the southern border with unprecedented numbers of people crossing illegally into this country. But there's another word that has replaced crisis. Disaster. And unless you're one of the few people who thinks that open borders are a great idea and most Americans don't, disaster maybe more accurately illustrates what's going on. How else can you describe 1.7 million people encountered trying to cross the border in the last 12 months? That's equivalent to every person living in the city of Phoenix trying to cross the border. And how many got away? We have no idea. Yuma, Arizona has seen a huge surge in migrants. The Yuma sector encompasses 126 miles of border with Mexico, from the Imperial Sand Dunes of California to the Yuma-Pima County line. And joining us now on Newsmaker Saturday is Yuma County Sheriff Leon Wilmot in his third term now as sheriff. Sheriff, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. I am more than welcome. All right, just give me a thumbnail. What in the world is going on? Because in August of 2020, the Yuma sector, and I know you're not, you're not border enforcement, but you've been sucked into this unwittingly. In August of 2020, the Yuma sector encountered 700 migrants. This year, August of 2021, agents encountered over 17,000 migrants. How is Correct. this affecting you? What's going on in Yuma? Well, the impacts for us have been uh, exponential as far as trying to fill the gap with our Border Patrol partners because now they've been taken off of the line. They're no longer down there along the international boundary, but they're actually spending more time processing all these individuals that have been apprehended along the border. So for a 60-mile radius along the international boundary, you might see four Border Patrol agents where you used to see one Border Patrol agent just about every mile. That's not happening. Is this, Sheriff, in your view, from a law enforcement perspective, is this by design? Are the smugglers more interested in moving contraband across the border and this is a great diversion? Or are they making money both ways, human trafficking and drugs? Well, what's important for everybody to understand is the cartels are the ones that control every mile of the international boundary. So they're making money on both ends. They have the human immigration aspect, which intentionally, by design, they have come across on certain areas of the border. So for Yuma County, for instance, all of this activity is happening along our river corridor with Baja, California. Then we have the Sinaloa cartel, which actually works out of Sonora, which is a southern desert area. So while they're tying up resources along the river corridor, we have the narcotics and other smuggling going on along the uh, eastern desert. So, so far this year, because of the smuggling out in the desert, we've encountered uh, 25 deaths out in the desert. Actually, we had one more the other day. And we have the large amounts of narcotics that are being smuggled across, which is going throughout the United States. So your overdoses in your communities, your overdose deaths, as well as the other criminal activity that's going on out east is also impacting us because Border Patrol is stuck at their station processing. So this, this is a prime example of the administration delivering a false narrative of border security because now they've interjected personal and political ideologies into enforcement which is impacting our, our law enforcement personnel. And now with the recent uh, memo that came out from Mayorkas, he's further diluted our federal partner's ability to enforce the rule of law by restricting them on what they can do and where. Okay, Sheriff, uh, you must know San Luis Police Chief Richard Jessup, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. My understanding is he is reporting, this is a border town next to Yuma, He's reporting that officers this year have encountered migrants from 40 different countries, 40. This used to be a Mexico, maybe Central America thing. We've got people now from all over the world coming here. 
Yuma sectors actually uh, encountered individuals from over 120 different countries, some of which are actually special interest countries, which have ties to terrorism. And that's our concern from a public safety standpoint when I was talking to you earlier. Those are the individuals that we're concerned with out in the Eastern Desert, because if you have individuals with terrorist ties, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, those are just some of them that have been encountered just in Yuma County. Now, you mentioned earlier the getaways. We know that there's been over 200,000 getaways in Arizona. These are people who come here and escape detection. I, the, the old so, formula, Sheriff, when I used to go down to the border, and I went there quite a bit 10 years ago, the formula was, and they never liked to talk about it, but it was for every one captured, the thought was three get away. Correct. Is that still the formula, or is it bigger now? I think you're looking at a formula that's probably bigger because you look at uh, the 1.9 million encounters that they've had along the southern border. For Arizona, I want to say it's been 114,000 just in Yuma sector alone this last fiscal year for them. And we had over 7,000 getaways just in Yuma County. Okay, so, so, so when we start talking about this, uh, and, and then there's discussion of, you know, who are these people? Is there some nexus to terrorism or terrorists who want to come into the country? I mean, obviously, the people who flew the, the planes in 9-11, they got here on student visas. They didn't have to, you know, game the system and cross the border. They did it the old-fashioned way. They overstayed their visas or were on student visas. You really believe that some of these people crossing the border right now may want to do us harm? This is not hyperbole. You really believe this? I, I believe that the, the individuals that wish to do our country harm are going to take the least way of getting into here. And right now, that's across the southern border. All right. There, there is video. There is no border patrol presence. I, I want to ask you about this video that I've seen. Um, smugglers coming across, they fly into Mexicali. Uh, they fly the people into Mexicali. From there, they take a bus to um, a Mexican town right across from Yuma. And after they get dropped off from the bus, then they just cross the Colorado River. This isn't like a they're snaking through the desert. You know, they're, they're taking a bus right to the edge and then walking across at a gap known as the gap. You know that area, the gap. There's where there's no border wall. And they're just walking across and offering themselves up, I guess with full knowledge that once they're here, they're good to go. That's, that's a daily occurrence. We, we've got, uh, right now they're averaging 650 apprehensions each and every day in Yuma County. I think on September 30th, they had uh, 5,000 individuals in their building over there at Border Patrol that had been apprehended. And they've had up to 1,000 a day as far as apprehensions go, just in Yuma. Have you been in that building? Can you describe what the conditions are like there? Because uh, I know a lot of the media has been shut out of these holding facilities. Can you describe what you're seeing in those holding facilities? It's basically a large tent. And when the individuals are brought in for processing, they do a medical screening on individuals to ensure that they don't have any abnormal medical conditions. That would that include COVID? See. Well, and, and that was part of the problem in the very beginning is they weren't even testing for COVID. And that's not being done at the Border Patrol station. That's just a processing location. Once they're done processed out of that tent, which they have like 24 hours roughly, then ICE takes custody of them and takes them either to a motel or they get bus to a motel in Phoenix or Tucson or California, and in some cases, Texas. And then that company that they've contracted with is responsible for doing any kind of COVID testing. And they're not being given the vaccine before they're released into the communities. They're just being allowed to get on a bus, train, airplane, to get into the interior of the United States. Sheriff, so who, decides, who decides where these people go? It's my understanding that ICE is uh, in charge of where they end up going. Is there, any rhyme, the is there any rhyme nor reason of where they go? Now, this gets into some cynical political stuff. Yeah. But is there a push to put, put these people into, quote, unquote, red states? 
I, I don't have any information on that. I can tell you that the uh, for the most part, what I'm being told is if they're uh, Cubans, they come in through Yuma sector and then they fly over to Florida. So because that's where they want to go. That would make sense. I mean, they probably yeah. have family there. Um, now, Catholic services, they get involved in some of this as well, moving people around and taking them in, right? Right. We have a large number of uh, non-governmental organizations that also help. And that was part of the problem early on is the fact that with the pandemic, the NGOs were having a hard time trying to find any volunteers to help with this like we did in 2019. So we didn't have a place for anybody to go. Border Patrol was stuck with just releasing these folks out into our community with no resources. And that was the impact locally here that we dealt with. And, and what everybody needs to remember is that of this 1.9 million that's been allowed in, each and every one of those individuals is either paying anywhere from $6,000 a piece up to $15,000 a piece, depending on what country they're coming from. So this is a moneymaker for the cartels, and this administration has turned ICE and Border Patrol basically into the transportation hub for the cartels to get individuals into the United States. Wow. Sheriff, can you describe what's happened in Yuma County in terms of crime rates? Uh, are you seeing a spike? Are you seeing uh, problems stemming from this kind of unprecedented movement through our border? Well, we've seen some impacts in regards to juveniles that were being smuggled across because they had been uh, violated by the uh, criminal element before they reached the United States. So. They've, they've been taken to our family advocacy centers. You've also seen uh, the narcotics that are coming in through uh, the eastern part. And when the U.S. attorney doesn't want to charge these individuals, then we end up cross-deputizing Border Patrol agents so they can actually charge these individuals. They catch smuggling hard narcotics and charging them through the state, which they end up in our jail. And we never get reimbursed by the federal government, but five cents on the dollar for inmates that are in our jail that have committed crimes that have entered the country illegally. Sheriff, so, this is a political question, but I've got to ask it. What would be the rationale for essentially flinging the border wide open? What, what would be the upside? What, why would anybody want to do this? Uh, I have no answer for that. Other than you want to tear apart the, the country from the inside out, I don't know. You can never sacrifice public safety, homeland security, or border security when you're put in a lead law enforcement role. And that's something that all of us sheriffs have said. And we've told that to Mayorkas. And the fact is, the, the last time I talked to him, I told him, I said, right now, because of your memos and your lack of supporting the men and women who are our federal law enforcement out there doing the job, you, you basically demean them, you've restricted them from being able to do their job, and their morale is at an all-time low. That's not the signs of a good leader, especially in his position. I, I, one of the most um, notable people ever to come out of Yuma was Cesar Chavez, who founded the United Farm Workers Union. Mm -hmm. Little bit of history. People may not know this. Cesar Chavez was firmly against illegal immigration because it undercut the farm workers union with cheap labor. He didn't like it. He didn't like the Bracero program where workers were coming across because it undercut his efforts to unionize. And in the mid 1970s, he even conducted an illegals campaign. That's what it was called to identify and report illegal immigration. This, this seems to have been lost in the, in the discussion that, that even uh, Cesar Chavez didn't like this stuff. No, no, he did. And right now, Yuma County obviously is a, a large agricultural community and 90% of America's winter vegetables come from Yuma. Right. And that's one of the things that we explained to uh, Mayorkas is you need to secure the border because this activity is going through farmland and you're going to impact our farmers and their ability to go out into their fields and process that growth because now these illegals have actually contaminated that farm area, and you can't utilize that. So right now, between October and December, 
is a big part of the agriculture and we have a lot of uh, individuals coming from our, our sister city in San Luis, Mexico, coming across every day to work. And they don't want this in their communities any more than we do here. That's interesting. Sheriff, I appreciate it. Sheriff Leon Wilmot, Yuma County Sheriff for many years. Appreciate you and uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. When you we too. come back, we're going to be joined by Richard Sines to talk about the Arizona Cardinals. How far could these guys go this year? How good is this football team? We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday. This will be fun. I guess it's fun. We're going to take a couple of minutes here to kind of look at where the Arizona Cardinals are at this point. Obviously, they drop a tough one to Green Bay. Their record drops to 7-1. and one. First loss of the year, they lose 24-21 at home against the Packers and Aaron Rodgers. But where does the team go from here? What's the projection now? Richard Sines, our sports director, joins us now. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. And I know it's going to be fun because people at home may not know this. We filmed this show without any film, without recording <laughs> almost every day when you come into the sports office and I we're know. talking about we it. So it's talk nice to actually record it. I bother you guys every day <laughs> talking about You're this. You're always welcome into the parlor. Okay, thank you, Richard. Okay, um, after the loss to the Packers, just give me a read on the team. Sometimes letting a little air out of the balloon can be a good thing for a team. Is this maybe in the long run? I know you can get into home field, but... Right. Is, is there some positive maybe in losing a close one and it's a reality check that, hey, it's not all peaches and cream. You're going to have some adversity. Absolutely. You can learn from something like this. And can we just recognize, though, the game that the Cardinals were in? I mean, this was the greatest Thursday night football matchup ever. Two teams with a combined record of 13-1. and one. This was also only the third time in NFL history that the reigning MVP was playing a team that was 7-0 and or better. It happened in 1985 with Dan Marino and the 12-0 and Bears. It happened in 2015 oh, yeah. with Aaron Rodgers against the Panthers that were 7-0. and So, again, and so this was one of the best games of the year, one of the greatest games on Thursday Night Football, and it involved the Arizona Cardinals. How cool is that? And then it turned out to be a great game. Right. I mean, think about it. The, the Not for we, Cardinals fans, but a very oh. good football game and such a winnable game for the right. Cardinals down the stretch. And the respect I think the Packers gave the Cardinals is impressive to me because when you look at the time of possession, the Packers held the ball for 15 minutes longer than the Arizona Cardinals. Think about this. Aaron Rodgers was playing keep away from Kyler Murray. That is what you call respect. They were running the ball, trying to run the clock down, keep Kyler Murray on the sideline. That could be a blueprint for other teams to say, yeah. hey, the best defense against the Cardinals is a good offense to keep Kyler Murray off the field because he can't score if he's on the sideline. And yeah. that's what the Sustained Packers did. Drives. Right. I thought it was interesting that, that after the game, Aaron Rodgers said when you know they were asking, what did you say to Kyler Murray? And, and he said, we'll see you in the playoffs. Yeah. So there is this kind of idea that these two will meet again. And the cool thing before the game, uh, you know, earlier in the week, we, we talked to Kyler Murray. We were asking him about Aaron Rodgers. This was the first time he'd ever played him. He says, I think he's one of my favorite quarterbacks. He goes, well, he is. And then he goes, well, one of my favorite quarterbacks. He goes, I like his swag. I like the way he plays. And, and when you think about it, you know, Aaron Rodgers has a lot of the same characteristics as Kyler Murray. He can run. He can throw on the run. He can throw sidearm. You know, yeah. and he's he got that run like swag. Kyler Murray, though. <laughs> exactly. He can, but he's quick. He's not yeah, fast, he but he's quick, quick yeah. enough to get away from the pressure. Sure. And that's one thing the Cardinals really couldn't do against Aaron Rodgers would put pressure on him. Yes, they didn't have J.J. Watt and Corey Peters, but part of it is just Aaron Rodgers. He's a guy that is so advanced mentally, it's like he has the answers to the test before he even gets the yeah. test. So where do you think they go from here? I mean, they're, they're halfway through the season, roughly. Um, they go to the ice tub is what they go. Yeah, like, right. You know, this ten, is the, ten, ten days is a good thing exactly. right now. Exactly. It, it comes at a good time. Get guys time to heal is up. Is Kyler Murray banged up? Kyler Murray was banged up on the on the run play right before that last pass. He kind of tweaked his ankle. You saw him go down and it was, it was it was twisted in a weird way. That's why he was limping. But I think the the, the loss hurt more than the ankle after yeah. the game. And he'll, he'll be okay. He'll be fine. And especially with these... 10 days to get ready. Corey Peters is back on that D-line. That helps out a lot because that was a, a big void that people weren't really noticing. Yes, J.J. Watt is a void as well. You got Chandler Jones back, but still, he comes back after COVID. And if, if you noticed, in any sport, even look at Devin Booker, when guys come back from being out with COVID, they're not the same. Their legs aren't there quite yet, and it takes them a while to get back. So these extra days of rest, I think, are really going to help yeah. the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, COVID takes it out of you. Yeah. I went you, down that you, road. You know, yeah. Yeah. It takes you a while to kind right. of get back, get on your feet. Um, the J.J. Watt loss, how much did that impact that game against Green Bay? 
and how much does it kind of take some things away from them going forward? Yeah, it was a big loss, especially when you consider how they didn't have much time to recoup from that loss. So when you look at the, the Green Bay Packers, they were like, yeah, well, they were missing their top two receivers. Yeah, but they knew they were going to be missing those guys. So they had time to adjust to that. The Cardinals found out they were going to lose J.J. Watt for the game just two days before, maybe a day and a half before. Then the day before, they find out they could lose him for the whole year. So they didn't have time to make those adjustments. They didn't have Corey Peters as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the reasons why they had so much trouble with the run. One, the Packers just run the ball well. And two, this all happened so suddenly. And I think Vance Joseph does a great job in, in dialing up different packages to get pressure on the quarterback and stop the run. And now that he has time to know, okay, this is what I'm working with. This is what I, I, I know I have or don't have. He'll make the proper adjustments. Okay, so for the Cardinals going forward, what do you see as the biggest challenges to them offensively or defensively kind of going into the home stretch of what should be a playoff run? Yeah, staying healthy is one and not dwelling on this loss. Okay, yeah, you had a tough loss, heartbreaking loss, a game you should have won. A.J. Green just turned around and the ball sticks into his arm. What, what happened there? Pass. What happened Well, there? I, I think he was thinking it was, a, it was a run play, which I don't know why he would be thinking that because with 14 seconds left, there's no way you could run the football because if you get tackled before you score the touchdown, your kicker has to come out and you're, you're, you're in a rush and he's not going to be able to kick the field goal. So everybody knew it's going to be a throw into the end zone, a quick throw into the end zone. Worst case scenario, it's incomplete. The clock stops. Your kicker comes out, right. kicks the field goal. You go into overtime. But actually, the worst case scenario was an interception, which is what happened. And if A.J. Green just turns around. And what I liked about this, John, is they didn't really throw A.J. Green under the bus. They said it's a miscommunication. They're not saying, well, he, he didn't turn around. He should have turned around. They said, look, we, maybe we didn't get him the signal. Maybe he didn't know because everybody else, I, I watched that play several times. All the other receivers were looking for a pass. They were not run blocking. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Cardinals going into this year, a lot of the prognosticators had them as pretty much a 500 team. Right. There weren't th these kinds of expectations on this team. That's liberating. It's a right. good thing sometimes. Sure. You can just fly under the radar. Now everybody knows they're good. Um, I mean, what do you make of why they don't get more respect even now, they're either fifth or sixth as a pick to win the Super Bowl. Right. With the best record in the league. Did you see, did you see the logo right there? It's, it's a Cardinal logo. It's not a star. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not a Cowboys star. That, that it doesn't be say it. LA. It, doesn't, it says Arizona. And, and this market just doesn't get respect, whether it's the Phoenix Suns or the Arizona Cardinals. You know, it, it, that's just the, the way it is. It's a, you know, LA bias, California bias, East Coast bias. Whatever it is, the Cardinals don't get respect. But, that's okay with them because that just is fuel to the fire for these guys. And think about it. Before the season started, if somebody would have told you or Cardinal fans, look, after week eight, you're going to be seven and one after <laughs> playing the Green Bay Packers yeah. games at Tennessee, at Cleveland, and at L.A., and you're only going to have one loss and be in first place in the division. I mean, the Cardinals and their fans would have said, where do I sign up for yeah, that you deal? you take that. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Because you could go 500 from here out and probably be a playoff team. Right. right? And you got some teams that you should beat. You got Carolina on the schedule. You got Chicago on the schedule. You still got a 49er team that's in disarray. You still got to play the Seahawks twice. The, the Seahawks should have Russell Wilson back. I was hoping they could play it without <laughs> Russell Wilson because they're a completely different team without him. Right. Just goes to show that this is a quarterback-driven league. When you look at you know the matchup you know on Thursday, Aaron Rodgers and, and Kyler are the, are the guys that make this team go? We've got 30 seconds. Um, it's enough of a sample size now. Yes. Are they a Super Bowl contending team? Are they a Super Bowl, potentially a Super Bowl winning team? Absolutely. When you consider they went toe to toe with Aaron Rodgers, a team that was this close to going to the Super Bowl last year, and if Aaron Rodgers runs it in instead of, you know, th throws it against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it's the Packers in the Super Bowl. And they right. had these guys on the ropes, John. So, yeah. yes. They've got what it takes. It's going to be fun. I know. Good to see you, man. Wait. Thank you for coming in. Anytime. With us. All right, we're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Special thanks to Yuma County Sheriff Wilmot and to Richard Sines filling us in on the Cardinals and what lies ahead in the remaining schedule and maybe a, a, a Super Bowl run. Who knows? Uh, by the way, for past shows, or if you want to send a link to this show, this is the place to do it. Go to fox10phoenix.com slash newsmaker. That'll get you access to all of the prior shows, and there's a bunch of content there. Thanks again for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. We will see you again next weekend.